talk about today, what we're going to talk about today is interface-based abstraction. And this will just be for, um, for about uh, 10 to 15 minutes here. Um, uh, in in class-based abstraction. The idea is we're creating classes and, and interfaces to capture similarity between sets of objects. Um, and we're going to introduce this notion of, uh, or emphasize this notion of a contract of, of uh, separation of, of uh, an interface or contract on the one hand from its implementation. So we talked about before, early on in this class, I introduced this notion of a, of a computational class. And I argued it's like a mold in which case, in which you can cast particular objects. So we have person class, it defines personhood or personness, and we have particular instances of those class that are particular people, particular persons. And uh, and it turns out that um, uh, we have many classes that we deal with in any logic. And we, once we have instances of those classes, objects, as we call them, we can perform operations on them. Like we can read their properties, ask about their name. We can call methods to perform a birth or what have you. Um, now, the, the key for, um, for reducing complexity uh, associated with um, software development important key for it is the notion of separating out an interface from an implementation. So separating out the contract, what's promised, say by a method, by uh, the name is infected, from how it's actually implemented. Okay, um, And we'll see this plays out big time in classes. And you'll see it used across any logic. Okay, We separate out what's promised of an agent in general from which particular agent you have. So there's a notion, so in any logic, you'll see common references to the agent class with a capital A-G-E-N-T. And many things can operate on agent, but there will be many particular classes that are instances of agent. It might be a person class, it might be a deer class, it might be a doctor class, and it might be a, uh, uh, a city. Can also be treated as an agent and so on. Okay? Um, there's, there's a certain contract associated with agenthood that all those agents have to satisfy, but there's many particular classes that will satisfy that and provide additional features. So what we're going to be talking about is the separation of, of, of this, these two things. Talk, we often talk about the separation of interface from implementation. But you could just as well talk about separation of sort of the standards or the terms of reference, the sort of what's promised, um, the what is promised from the how, the what is promised from, from the implementation. Okay? And we use specifications, descriptions, in, often in English, in, uh, using the name, to indicate the expected behavior. Of, of anything providing this interface. And, and it gives a sense of sort of what, what is required to do the work and then what's promised if, if you meet those requirements. Okay. Um, and it turns out this distinction between interface and implementation forms a key role in many areas of uh, possible uh, human activity. And I'll, I'll just go through some examples here. Um, this simplifies our lives in many, in many areas. It really wasn't until computer scientists started to formalize some of these notions that this became obvious. But if you think about it, um, the fact that we have certain standards in place, certain uh, uh, defined rules of operation, allow us to maneuver within our daily lives with much greater ease. And I'll, I'll mention some examples here. Uh, and then we'll see how this applies computationally uh, in the final minutes and then on Friday. For example, I was just out in New York City. Um, to give a talk, and we use some taxis. And the fact that every taxi is basically the same, they're basically interchangeable, is really, really useful. It allows me to hail a taxi you know, in the morning and then again in the afternoon without having to worry about is it the same taxi, right? Um, I don't have to worry if it's exactly the same driver, the same cab. All I know is, okay, if I step out into the, to the road and I wave at it in a certain way that that it will stop for me. Or if I look and I see if it's lighted up in a certain way, I know if it's taking passengers or not. I know that if I go in there, it'll have a standardized meter that will take credit cards in New York City, and it will 
have a certain amount, a certain rules for how much they charge me. And I don't have to worry they're going to charge me an arm and a leg to go some long distance. So, you know, this allows me to put aside a lot of worries about how that particular taxi works, you know, the particular aspects of the driver's history, how, what particular engine it has. All I know is if I go in this way, they'll charge me a certain amount for these distances and there's these rules of engagement. Well, okay, so there's some things that are not controlled, but there are many things that are controlled. That's true. That's why you had to tell one of the stocks, taxis, uh, after he'd started up, he said, I don't know how to get there. I don't know how to get there. We said, stop, stop now. Yeah. <laughs> and we got out and we got another taxi. Um, so you're right. It doesn't solve all problems, but there's a lot of things that you don't have to worry about because of it. It simplifies your life. It doesn't make it simple. Um, simple, you know, MBTA. I can buy a station. I can buy a ticket down here. Um, I just recharge my ticket at Kendall, but I can use it, you know, all throughout the MBTA system. For delivery companies, I can look up on FedEx's website about the rules for, you know, what time I need a package to be at a FedEx site, and I could see how long it takes that package for different levels of charges, how, mo how long it takes them to get it from source to destination, and I can count on that. I don't have to worry if it's the Cambridge FedEx, the, the Malden FedEx, or the New York FedEx, these rules of engagement apply. Car rental similarly. If I go to an enterprise rent-a-car thing and I know that I, I uh, looked in the enterprise site and I see these are the rates and these are the terms of insurance that they offer, I can count on that. And suffice it to say that this is at these rules, the separation of um, the rules of engagement or the standards from the implementation is key for making this world work for us computation. Um, so you can build an app for Android, and it will work on any Android phone of this vintage or like. Or I can take my Wi-Fi based computer and I can go to all different places in the MIT campus and indeed across the world and I can be I can count that it will work with the local Wi-Fi. I don't have to worry if it's a Cisco router or a Netgear router or whatever, it all works. It's a separation of interface from implementation, we say. We know what is guaranteed what is required, what is guaranteed if you provide those requirements, and the implementation is, is n not my worry. The how it's accomplished is not my worry. This gives us big benefits in terms of ability to modify the code. Um, we can uh, bind together pieces without worrying about all the details of how the other piece is, is implemented. I can use my computer with routers without knowing all the deal. I can replace one implementation by another. I could have a Netgear router replace it by a Cisco router, be fine. And I can reuse things. So um, uh, within my, um, uh, for example, I might be able to uh, uh, have, have certain things that work with uh, any agent uh, within my model, and I can reuse it when I have a person agent, or I can reuse it with a doctor agent, or what have you. So, uh, given that time is, is limited here, I am just going to show, I'm going to um, give you a peek about some of the practical implications is for any logic. The often thing is we have a set of related uh, classes or set of related um, concepts and we wish to capture sort of a commonality between them. We wish to be able to, for example, have patients have characteristics of persons, health professionals, and to be multiple types of doctors, have some things that operate on doctors, some things that operate on all people, and have them scale naturally to larger numbers of doctors, larger numbers of health professionals, larger numbers of persons. But even more critically, so this is one implication, we're going to be talking about how you can do this in any logic, okay? Um, and what that means is how you can write just one thing per person and have it carry through to all the others. But another thing we're going to be talking about is the fact that person itself, by virtue of being an implementation of an, of an agent, any person can be used where agents are expected. So, um, for example, the connect to method that we use to connect up to persons is actually an operation on agents. And any 
any type of agent class, be it a deer, be it a doctor, a person, um, a patient, uh, you know, a city, we can call connect to on that. It will just work. So we can have this, this uh, reuse. So um, we'll be talking in, um, in any logic about the implications for this. It turns out it also bears on the things we talked about earlier in this session. For example, the fact that a given set is actually defined with what's called an interface. There's actually no class called set. There's an interface called set. And yet there's many classes that implement this. Uh, for example, an immune set, or a hash set, or a linked hash set, or a tree set. And these each have characteristics. They all operate as a set. They all provide all the guarantees that a set provides, but they provide them with uh, different levels of performance, for example, or different levels of, of memory use. Um, so uh, we're going to be talking in Java about uh, how this works behind the scenes, how you can um, define your own hierarchy of agents, for example, or agent classes. And we're going to take a look at a model which uses this. So there's an HPV model, which if it's not already there, I'm going to be uploading. Which, where basically we have um, uh, persons, we have males and females, and males and females share certain characteristics, but males and females each have their own distinctive characteristics in the model. And uh, so they can make use of the common characteristics and implement all their own. So we're going to see how this works, uh, works next time. And we'll also see how central it is to Java and indeed to um, to, uh, to any logic, how any logic works from the ground up. We talked about this earlier today, and I noted that I was going to be explaining it later, how we have these collection classes, like in fact, interfaces like set, queue, and list. Each of these is a so-called subtype of a collection. So anywhere a collection is expected, you can substitute one of these in. In fact, you could substitute in any new set where a collection is expected, or a link hash set. Where a set is expected, you can substitute any num set, or a sorted set, or a tree set, etc. And similarly, um, when it comes to, to how any logic is implemented, any logic has four types of transition classes uh, associated with the transition with the message, transition with the timeout, with the condition, and with the rate. Um, there's an experiment class in any logic, which takes And then there's several subtypes <coughs> of experiment ones. Each of these makes use of this subtyping hierarchy, and we're going to be able to make use of it um, as well for, for our classes. The thing to realize is that while we may define this component and use subtyping and subclassing, which have some uh, subtle relationships, uh, subclassing means sort of a special type of subclassing well, they fit into a general hierarchy in any logic where there's additional components. For example, all agents are examples of an active object, but main is also an example of an active object. Both of them are active objects and can be presented, for example, um, on the screen as a result of it. These also are examples of, of, uh, of, of agent class. So we're going to see how this fits together. And hopefully it will help you understand sometimes while we'll sometimes see a reference to an agent and we'll have to cast it to a person. We'll have to coerce it to be a person. We treat it as an agent, but it's also a person. A woman is also a person, also an agent, also an active object. So we'll see how this is accomplished um, uh, and sort of how the structure fits together, I should say, uh, next time. And we'll take a look at some, some models which exploit this. Okay? So that's all for today. Uh, thanks for bearing with this um, crazy situation.